One of the toughest things about being an orthodontist is understanding how to properly navigate the federal and state requirements that play a role in our clinical and day-to-day -day lives. Well, what if I told you there was someone out there who could give you the answers, as well as a consultant to help you with better scheduling and how to run a more effective, lower stress practice? Well, today I've got that for you. So, as I tell you every single time, buckle up or get on the treadmill or grab your drink, but whatever you do, do not miss my interview with Andrea Cook. Hey there, everybody. We are lucky today because we have the one, the only Andrea Cook with us today. Say hi, Andrea. Hello, everybody. See, she really is there. Um, but it's really, really nice when we can get folks in here who are on the circuit speaking about things and consulting and helping practices. And first, before we get started, I really want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because um, for those of you out there, I always tell the truth about what goes on behind the scenes. And technical spe technically speaking, we've had so many glitches trying to make this happen. She has been so remarkably patient to bring this to you. So thank you, Andrea. I appreciate it. You're welcome. I do feel like I was causing part of the issue. So, but I appreciate you having me on and patience with me. <laughs> well, if anybody's cause, it was me. I'll take all the blame. So, <laughs> so um, before we get started, uh, well, actually, as we get started, let's jump in and talk a little bit about um, your history. First, you know, while I know who you are and a ton of people out there know who you are, if you could kind of introduce everybody to what it is you do um, and who you are, and then maybe take us back a little bit about how you ended up where you are today doing what you do, if that's okay. Absolutely. Well, I'm an orthodontic clinical consultant. And the, the difference between me and a lot of the other consultants out, out on the uh, training circuit and speaking is I work mostly with the clinical or strictly with the clinical teams and on the sterilization and OSHA side. There's a lot of... Uh, absolutely fabulous consultants that work more on the TC and the marketing <clears throat> and the business side of the practice. But really, nobody wants to touch my world, which is I go in and clean people up and get you back on track. And it was it's very interesting you ask where I came from, because today I had the opportunity to speak to the residents of the graduating class of the University of Washington. And the professor at the University of Washington is Dr. David Turpin. And Dr. David Turpin is the one who I first started working for as an orthodontic assistant way back in 1987. So we have this huge history, and he was one of my best teachers, my best mentors, still a great person, friend, orthodontist. So it was just kind of an interesting um, full circle today as I go back. Um yeah, and it was it was very fun. So I scared all of the residents as they're as they're trying to graduate about what they need to do about sterilization <laughs> and OSHA. <laughs> Today you did that. Yes, I did. Yeah, and I'm here in Dallas. I thought I heard some screaming coming from the west <laughs> about about oh. three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, you should have, because one of them said, "I don't know if I want to graduate and get out of this program and deal with all of this stuff, because it really isn't fun." What I, you know, the ocean sterilization side of it, but no. And do you know how many things in my office I've had to change without anybody, without me ever having seen you speak up until recently? Do you know how many things I've had to change in my office because my team? heard from a friend something that you said and uh and it had to suddenly change everything in our practice so uh you put the fear of god into many <laughs> an assistant out there um and you know i'm just gonna bury my head in the ground and pretend i never heard it that's all i'm saying as long I'm as just... they're as long as they've got you taken care of you're good to go <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah. um so you help in schools and you help in practices what are some of the the topics that you typically cover Anything after a patient says yes to your TC, they come into my world. I work closely with the TCs because we have to work together, but I work on anything in the clinic from training to emergencies to treatment times, anything that happens with that patient and the efficiency and how we can make our doctor's lives easier and our team's lives easier by working efficiently and smarter. Those are the things I address. Sterilization goes into that because if we don't have the instruments, we can't work efficiently. OSHA goes into that because we need to practice good, safe practices for our teams and our doctors. 
So it just comes off a full circle with the clinic and the sterilization in OSHA. And it's the best best area of the practice. So when you, when you look at, um, when you look at practices and they bring you in, what are some of the more, um, where where are the areas where most practices really need your help? What is it that they're really looking for? Um, and I'll stop there because I have another question for you after that. What is the number one thing you get called in the offices to do? And I guess the follow-up would be, what is the number one thing you should be getting brought into practices to do that you're not being brought in for? Probably the biggest pain point for practices when they call me is, oh my gosh, my emergencies are out of control. I need help getting that number back in line. And the the resolution for that is is sometimes different than what doctors think. Sometimes it is a result of we have a poor scheduler up front that dumps everybody into an emergency appointment. Sometimes it is um, truly a clinical problem that we have bond failures. We have things like that going on. And some of the, th- some of the times it's training. They don't know what's going on. So that's probably the one of the, the SOS calls that I get that say, oh my, we've got to get this under control. Two of the things I like to be brought in for are, one of them is developing training. I think there's in the orthodontic industry, you hire somebody, you throw them into a chair, and there's a pretty good uh, failure rate as far as clinicians getting frustrated and either leaving or the doctor getting frustrated with she's just not catching on. But it's all boils down to poor training. So I encourage offices to do a lot of really good training to develop team members that want to be with you for a long time, that want to be a mini doctor. Um, that's how I was trained. And it's it's a great way to bring team members on and keep them. The other one is sterilization. There's still a lot of burying the head in the sand about sterilization compliance and OSHA I, compliance. I think I literally use those words that I'm just going to bury my head <laughs> <laughs> in the sand. I think I actually, not that I would, but I think I actually use those words. <laughs> Most do. Yeah. Um, there was just a, in, in Burien, Washington, which is just a little bit north of me, there was actually a, a recent breach where uh, the state dental board got called in and the doctor got a $9 million settlement against him for lapses in it, simple things. Documentation is a big piece of their checklist now that they're really pushing for state dental board and OSHA. And so it's... Uh, nobody wants to deal with this, but it's a good time to not bury your head in the sand. Most orthodontics, orthodontists will go through their career without a state dental board or OSHA visit. But it's time to say, hey, if it does happen, I'm prepared. I've got backup. I know what I'm doing and be ready for it if it does. But most of you are going to uh, retire, sell your practice or whatever, and never, ever have to deal with this. So are you at liberty to in any way discuss any details of what caused the $9 million settlement? Because I've been around the block a few days. I've never heard a number like that ever. This was a – the only time they do something as um, strong as a a settlement like that is if there is blatant – in fact, right. control breaches. So this one had, and you, uh, if anybody is interested, I'm happy to send them to l- the link to the full legal disclosure. So this one had no sp- no spore test since j- uh, January 4th of 1998, no ultrasonic cleaner log, um, no log for changing cold sterile solution, expired products, ultrasonic and cold sterile solutions, instruments were stored loose in areas containing dust and debris, no hospital-grade surface disinfectant, obvious blatant disregard for compliance. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Nine, so, and not $9 million. $9 million settlement well, against him. Well, that, in your opinion, though, you're not an attorney. Will that actually stand up on appeal? Like, can they appeal this? That I don't know. Um, no, I don't. This was uh, from the Department of Health... Um, this was the, the statement of charges. So I don't know if they can appeal it. I'm not uh, sure of that. And it, it, at this point, I'm not really sure that it matters. 
because right. even if they appeal it, his name was in the paper. Yeah. His name was in the public eye for yeah. blatant disregard. So I don't know if you can ever recover from that reputation. No. no so, um, and, and if we can, just for a quick sidetrack, you mentioned two agencies. And for those out there who may be younger or less experienced or just don't know, it's very different what the state board and what OSHA are looking for, correct? Absolutely. One, one is looking predominantly for things related to workplace safety, and mm -hmm. the other is looking predominantly for patient patient safety, correct? Correct. Okay. And OSHA obviously being the one looking for workplace and the other being state board being for protecting the public, if you will. Correct. Be because I often hear people make misstatements. You know, you'll hear your team say, you know, um, you better bag those instruments because if you don't, that's an OSHA violation. And I'll often say to them, are you sure that that's an OSHA violation or is that a state dental board violation? Not to be a wise guy, but to just make it clear to them that OSHA protects them mm -hmm. you know, from needle sticks, from a whole variety of things. And that the state dental board, um, I would suspect, is the one who really cares if I'm bagging my instruments, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's misunderstood a great deal. Um out there. And OSHA is a federal uh, organization, while the state dental board is just a state organization, correct? Correct. Now, you can also have your state OSHA, which in Washington, we have what is called WISHA. Oh, so you oh, still have to comply with OSHA, but now you get to also comply with WISHA. Now, our WISHA is going under a big review on their processes and their regulations, too. So you get to do both. And it's, yeah. I, you are aware of it, but it's it's daunting to look at this. Yeah, for those people who don't know out there, you and I've chatted. You know, I know where you live. I don't mean that like as a threat. Hey, Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> I know where you live. Um, Some but, people would like that. Yes. <laughs> for those of you who'd like to know where she lives, please reach out to me after this. <laughs> we can arrange it. Um, no, but I practiced in Seattle for 17 years, truly West Seattle. And so I'm very familiar with uh, Department of you know, Safety and all the other WISHA, OSHA and all the other things that go along with it. And um, I was always very surprised by how stringent Washington State laws were compared to other places I practiced because Washington State don't play. They no. ain't messing around. And I was on peer review uh, for a few years when I was part out there. And they're they're strong. They are they don't mess. And so. Let me, that leads me to my next question. Um, are there, in your opinion, uh, purely subjective, which states really regulate the bejesus out of people? And which states, in your opinion, are the most hands-off when it comes to that? If that uh, can be said. California, definitely the strictest. Canada, yeah. if we have Canadians on this, Canada has gone overboard and... They are extreme, even putting Canada or excuse me, putting California um, down as far as what their requirements are. And Washington is almost getting, well, pretty close. This new change they're they're implementing and working on now will be pretty close to as strict as California. So I see a trend moving in that direction. And it's because we've had some lapses and we've had some reports, things going on that I feel that it's it's coming down the pike for the rest of us too, for the rest of the states. That this may be in your future. I I, I can't predict. I don't know. But if if you're doing any design or anything, plan for it so that you can make a change if you have to, and then deal with what you want to do for today. That's great but advice. Some of the some of the um, middle of the U.S. is probably a little bit more lax in theirs. As far as that, but everybody still has to follow the CDC federal guidelines. Right. So Washington got all up in arms about these changes. And w when I had a meeting with them, I said, you know, the changes that you're making are in line with the current CDC, which you still have to comply with. So it's not as radical as you might think if you really look in depth at the CDC. Well, but you, you use the term lax. Right. The middle of the country is a little more lax. So that would infer, and maybe I'm incorrect, that you see these quote unquote radical changes as actually being justifiable that to protect the public. Or do you think in some ways that, you know, even though we have to comply, 
Do you think sometimes there's levels of redundancy, like Boeing builds into their planes? You know, that sometimes I'm glad that my plane has redundancies, right? So that yes. the main line, do you feel that sometimes you're going a little bit overboard with these things? Or do you feel like what you see implemented is actually really solid and good and, and should be implemented the way it is? <laughs> Uh, a little bit of both. I feel some of the, the regulations and some of the things that they require us to do make me feel comfortable, would make me feel comfortable as a patient in a practice, knowing that I'm taken care of and that I don't have to risk a transmission of anything, uh, disease or anything. But then we have to get into the reality and making these ha things be able to happen when I have offices seeing 100 patients a day. And how are we going to physically make that happen? So I find a little bit of challenge in that it, over the top. Right. Um, and I get they have to protect the best. I get that. There is some redundancy between the state regulations and the federal regulations. There, You always have to have follow the federal if unless your state is more stringent, then you have to add more. Like California, more stringent. So I have to follow federal and state as well. But some of it is is very, very challenging to justify to the doctors and the team on why you need to do this and how it's going to be implemented and what we're going to gain from doing it, public safety and team safety. So I do have a hard time with some of their some of their guidelines. Okay. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, you mentioned the word radical when you referred to the Canadian laws that have just happened. Um, can you explain a little bit about like an example of what might be termed a radical uh, rule? Um, one of theirs is the sport test has to be, have to be done on a daily basis. Part wow. of that makes sense to me because if I have a machine failure, I would like to know about it in the States. It's on a weekly basis. That's uh, time and expense. That's a lot for an office to deal with. They have to, have, they're stricter on their packaging. Um, when they do a design, they have to have separate sinks for instruments and hand washing. You can't do that in the same sink, causing some issues with space. Trying to fit everything into a realistic space is a challenge as well. So they they had some challenges a few years ago and then went, like I said, they went full tilt on, you know, we're going to make sure we are safe. And by the way, are, are people getting grandfathered in? No. So if I have a practice, I am maxed out to my limits with space and I'm practicing in Burien. And which is Washington for those out there who don't know. And um, all of a sudden now I've got to find a place for a second sink to wash hands. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. There is I mean, no grandfathering in that when they make the chin changes as a dental health care professional, your responsibility is to be aware of the changes, where the, the guidelines are and what you need to do to comply. Wow. And I guess all of this, as you said, is, built upon the ever-changing federal CDC guidelines. Correct. So if Washington State is implementing that, they're only implementing it because the CDC made an updated policy that they are now following. They will never be stricter than the CDC, I suspect, correct? Um, they, they follow pretty closely, but they can be stricter than, like California. In uh, For federal CDC guidelines, it states instruments that are going to be used immediately or within a short time do not need to be packaged prior to sterilization. California blanket statement, everything is packaged, period, prior, prior to sterilization. So they can implement a stricter guidelines for the federal than the federal, but at minimum, you have to follow the federal. So how does one, I, I understand with OSHA, that if I have uh, a disillusioned former employee or current employee, or just somebody who feels like they're doing the right thing, they can file a complaint with OSHA. OSHA could come in and do an investigation and find that perhaps we're disposing of sharps incorrectly or any number of things that are putting the risk of my employees um, out there. Um, how does one typically get into trouble with the state board for sterilization violations. Where does this get found? And like you said, most people will never have a visit. But when they do have a visit, how is that visit 
propagated? How does it start? For the state dental board, the patient will see something. So I was in an office last week and they were using a dentronic sterilizer. And I understand why people do these things. It's an efficient C thing. So after the instruments came out of the dentronics, they were loose. They would put them into a sterilization pouch in groups that they were used and they would take those to the chair and use them that way. Now, what somebody could see is a sterilization pouch without the indicator changed colors and say, hmm, I don't think those instruments have been sterilized because that pouch hasn't changed colors. If you have somebody in the office that is aware, they're when a dental saying, assistant. When you, when you say someone sees, we're not referring to the employees, we're referring to a potential patient. Correct. So a patient is sitting in the clinical area, mom's back there watching, and they see that the instrument pouch hasn't changed colors. If they're educated, maybe they're a hygienist, maybe they're a nurse, maybe they're in the dental field or something like that, and they see that, that's their doubt. The two biggest calls to the state dental board from an assistant standpoint are assistant going from the mouth patient's mouth up to the keyboard and then back to the patient's mouth without a glove change that's, or that's the, a n- number one complaint from a layperson. Well, there's two so that one and then the assistant going from the mouth into a drawer to retrieve something in their side unit and then back into the patient's mouth that's what the patients are seeing they're not asking you about your spore test they're not Right. Asking you about those things. They know what they see and they saw something they didn't like. So can a disgruntled patient who, for instance, I'm not paying my bill. Oh, yes, you are. Great. They pick up the phone, they call the state dental board and they file a complaint that has nothing to do with what really happened. Does that ever happen? I'm sure it does. Um, if somebody is so um, angry or the finding a way to get back at an office, I'm sure it does. I don't think OSHA or your state dental boards act on every call they get. If right. there's a blatant call that something terrible happened, a disease transmission, um, something right. really happened. But if I call the state dental board and say, I saw somebody, my, the assistant, went into a drawer and retrieved something with her dirty gloves on, that's not going to trigger, in my opinion trigger a, a state dental board visit. They're too busy for that. Yeah. But if there's repetitive, if there are extenuating circumstances, something. Right. And it comes down in Washington. We just had one with the um, assistant that, or no, she was, she was a front office person was uh, let go from her position and was disgruntled. And she called the state dental board and reported that they were re- reusing disposable items. And so that got out as well. Um, I, I just, I just heard an office. I heard from a professional today about an office they worked in that was reusing disposable um, air water syringe tips. Yeah, I have actually seen that in offices. Yeah, they drop it in the cold sterile. Yeah. Yeah. It's Do you amazing. know they're like 0.01 cents a piece? Yeah. It costs, I, it costs more for your cold sterile than it does to replace them. But I know. But but if you called and said, hey, I saw Smith, John Doe, Doe Orthodontics, um, you know, I saw them do X, Y, or Z. They'll probably make a note of it. And if they start seeing repeated calls, then they'll do something. But if I yeah. called and said, hey, by the way, I just went to my doctor after getting a cold sore. He diagnosed me as having herpes, right? I, I They'll say I have a herpes virus or something. And uh, he thinks after we discussed it that I got it from my dentist. That probably would trigger somebody that, coming out, right? That could, yes. I would think okay. that would be more more of a trigger than somebody using a disposable, right. reusing a disposable suction tip. But right. I don't so, know what gets their, I don't know what gets their inspector, inspectors out there for sure. Right. But once, so God forbid someone listening here gets that, I assume it's going to be either a letter or a phone call, or do they just show up? Um, I've had one of my offices get a letter from the state dental board that said their assistants were using high speed hand pieces and they were in a state where they were not supposed to be using high speed hand pieces. And by the way, you should check a review of your infection control would be appropriate based on the report. That was just a letter. They can just show up at any point. Right. And so uh, 
do you have any, I mean, again, it goes by state, I'm sure. Um, but if someone were to show up tomorrow into my office and say, hi, I'm Andrea Cook from the state dental board, and I'm here to, um, I need to go point me to the clinical area and the sterilization area because I'm going back there. And they show appropriate credentials. Do I have a right to say, whoa, 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 um, you're not going anywhere yet. I, my attorney said that if I was ever a call, I have to call him first. Can you mind take a seat? Or do they have the right to just go back and to protect the public, so to speak, just do whatever they want to do? What are our rights as far as you know? Um, when a, when you get an inspection from either OSHA or the state dental board, what's going to happen is you're going to come in the office. You're going to have your front office trained to say, oh, you know, welcome to the practice. Um, can I do <laughs> well, <laughs> Welcome. Would you, would you like a cookie or water? Can I get you some water? Perhaps you'd like a coffee. You know, guys, <laughs> and then over the headset. I'm calling them quick. I, 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 hi, <laughs> get everything out. Everything, uh, run. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to do. Everybody uh, run. Would you like a cookie while we uh, <laughs> while we run? We're using right, our right, evacuation right. right. <laughs> you know, someone pull, pulls the lever in the back in the event of OSHA pull red knob. Oh, you know, and they get to launch out. Yeah. Oh, I hope to God they never see them in my office. But oh, absolutely. Jo- joking aside, when OSHA or Wisha show up, what happens? So they show up, your front desk will ask them for two pieces of identification stating, one, that who they are who they are, say they are, and what department they are from. Now, at that point, your front office can say, would you like to have a seat while I go get, and you should have this down pat, when you while I go get my OSHA coordinator or my infection prevention coordinator, whatever you call your lead person that is handling this, and or the doctor. And they can say yes, and they can say no, I'd like to go ahead and go back. Because um, once you bring the doctor out or the OSHA um, prevention coordinator, the OSHA coordinator, they can say, we're right in the middle of a busy afternoon. Could you wait until the end of the day? And we would be happy to go all, over all of our documents and our training manuals and all of that. They can say, yes, I'd be glad to have a seat. And I will wait. And they can wait there. They can wait in the clinical area as well. Or they can say no. If there's a cause or whatever it is, they can go ahead and go back into the clinical area as well and say, no, I would like to meet with your clinical court, your OSHA coordinator at this time. They have the right to do that. Most of them don't. Most of them would say, yes, we can wait until, you know, lunch or whatever. As, as the inspection starts, the sooner you start producing documents, they'll they'll ask for a few basics. I want to know your OSHA coordinator. I want to see your spore test results. I want to see your, uh, your hazard communication manual. I want to see these basic pieces of information. And as soon as you start saying, okay, here's our OSHA coordinator. Here's our manuals. Here's our documentation. Here's our <laughs> sterilization logs. When you start saying those things, they settle down. If you start saying, um, I don't, uh, we don't have spore test results because we haven't done them because I forgot to, or I don't know where the SDS manuals are. I think they're in the other office. If you start saying those things, they're going to get a little bit more intense on you. So if you have those documents, <clears throat> start producing them, show them that I am trying. We're trying to do this. Right. As soon as you start saying those things, they settle down. They are going to leave you with a list of changes. That's what they do. They're going to say, I'll be back in 30 days. Here's your list of things you need to change. And I'll be back. And that's probably going to be the end of it. They'll come back. You'll make your changes. That's it. But if you start saying, like this doctor that was in Burien, um, I haven't spore tested since 1998. Down down with the government. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) They're, you they're bastards can't hold me down. <laughs> Who do you think you are coming into us? Hardworking people. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah, you're probably going to get shut down, and you're probably going to get a, a, you know, pretty good, pretty substantial fine. Right now, the OSHA fines are thirteen thousand per violation. So, right. and and so the, the rule of thumb <laughs> is that when you do get visited, which I hope nobody listening to this ever gets visited. The, you sh- that is not the moment to start flexing your muscle and saying, you have no right to be here. You shouldn't be in here. I'm calling your supervisor. You know, it's the time to sort of eat crow because you know they're there and just suck it up and do the absolute best you can to help them in their endeavor and get them out as fast as you can. 
give them what they want and your life will be much easier. Sure. One poor doctor, I, I got a call from a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> he called and he said, oh my gosh, I need your help right now. He said, we just had a new patient. And when the, they filled out the paperwork, the dad's role job is he's an ocean inspector. And he said, you know, for the life of me in the exam, I couldn't think of anything, any teeth things at all. All I could think about was, oh my gosh, where's my documentation? Do I have any documentation? <laughs> Who's touching what? So he said, I just panicked. And he knew at that point. I don't have anything to protect myself. And the, the the guy was in dad mode. He brought his kid in. He wasn't in that mode, but it was great awareness for him to say, yeah. hey, I, I, I need to get this taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. And um, it's unfortunate when it happens, but I used to have a friend whose dad trained people in OSHA years. And right when, I mean, if you're old enough like me, you can remember when OSHA became OSHA. Right. Yeah. And yeah. When, I remember it. I'm trying to guess what year it was, but I'm guessing the early 90s, like 92, 93, 94. Right there. Yeah. You know, right? I had a friend whose dad, who was an entrepreneur, saw the laws come out and immediately started creating OSHA training manuals and documentation manuals and all the things and went into offices. And, you know, it's unfortunate we need these things, but we read about the cases where people do get diseases. Sometimes yeah. on purpose and sometimes by accident because of what people are doing and negligence. Yeah. What happens, what happens when they come in for a non-infectious disease uh, and the state board comes in? Because we're talking OSHA. What happens when the state dental board comes in and says, you know, like you said, the letter they got about high-speed hand pieces and, you know, please check for infection control and all those other things. What happens in those cases? How If they have a report that someone was doing something that was illegal, my assist, I'll give you something blatant that just doesn't happen so that nobody could ever say it was them. You know, we have a report that your assistants are using scalpels to uncover impacted second molars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I don't think there's a practice on earth that has their assistants uncovering second molars with scalpels, right? Not of mine. No, but it's a blatant violation of state law. But when they come in, their assistants are not using scalpels to uncover second molars. What happens? How, how does that whole thing sort of work itself out? I don't know if they can prove it if they don't see it. They, I mean, they can ask the assistants, but if the assistants all say, oh, no, you know, we don't use scalpels to uncover second molars. If they say that, unless they stay in the office and actually see it happening, I don't know what would happen at that point. Yeah. Um, usually there's enough fear in people that they say, oh, OK, you know, we've been using scalpels. We need to stop doing that or it is going to get discovered and I'm going to lose my license. Right. I don't know if that does it, but unless they come in and see it or get one of the assistants to say something, then that. Now, that letter that I that the doctor received, it a lot of it stems back to there was a, an assistant let go. Yeah. And, and here we go. Here we are. I'm, I'm, you know, it's an interesting discussion because in our groups, we have a lot of discussions about, well, what do I do with my, my assistant does this? What if my assistant does that? And, you know, many times, yeah, not many times, in life, <laughs> it's often worth looking at the long-term consequences of doing something you don't want to do versus, you know, feeling like you're right and I'll show them and doing the cheaper thing, someone leaves and you decide I'm not going to pay them any severance because of X, Y, or Z, as opposed to maintaining a great relationship with them when they leave. Um, mm -hmm. Because a scorned former employee, whether they have cause or no cause, can pick up the phone at any moment and level a, a, a justified or unjustified complaint against you at the state board. And I'm not saying people should live in fear, but sometimes we're penny wise and pound foolish. And and, and I, I agree. I I agree. And I, I like to, you know, well-treated employees don't do things like that. Well-treated employees respect their doctors. And there's a mutual respect that goes along with that. So uh, I, I don't feel like every employee that's let go is going to be that person that calls in. Most of them just realize, yes, this was, you know, I, I deserved it or for whatever reason. But it usually stems around money. Yeah, Most of them it's do. Unfortunate. And yeah. you you and I joked a little bit, not really a joke, but anybody listening to this out there, and here's about the state dental board, right? State dental boards have been on the news for other things recently, particularly their inability to keep up with one certain company in terms of mm -hmm. lawsuits. And there's a lot of pending legislation going on around the United States right now that may shape teleo dentistry in every state and how certain companies can operate in the orthodontic uh, sphere. And you and I sort of 
half-heartedly commented on how those of us who actually are following the rules, i.e. most orthodontists, are being burdened with tremendous rules and regulations that these other companies are not. And that it just it just seems like the it's not just about being able to operate from a distance. It's about w- operating under all the laws, which we'll all say it, it's not fair. But what are you going to do, right? Yeah, that's it. it. Yes, it's it's not fair. And I don't agree with some of the regulations and I don't. But push come to shove. It's a regulation until you get that regulation changed or it's something really happens. Awesome. That's what. That's what we have to go by. Yeah. And if you don't, it, it, like I said, the risk of, of getting an inspection is pretty slim, but. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's it. But the point we were making earlier is that the out of state al- aligner companies don't have assistance. No, follow. they don't let go of employees in the state because they don't have employees. Right. They yeah. it's just it's unbelievable that the the ever widening gap between the companies that are operating on the fringe of the law are actually operating on the fringe of the law. They're not, they don't have to fall under the rules and regulations that we do. And uh, it's an unfair playing field. Now, until someone's able to take them on and level that playing field, and I don't know who will, um, yeah. you know, it is what it is, but there's no OSHA inspector who's going to suddenly show up at the headquarters one morning and say, Hey, we have a complaint from a former employee that you guys are doing X, Y, or Z, but all of us are sort of, sort of, unfortunately, uh, subject to that. And it's, I'm not going to complain about it because I can't. It's just an observation more than anything. And that's, that's what it is. It's an observation. And I agree it's unfair. And I agree these are strict guidelines. I just get caught in between compliance and, you know, trying to figure out how it's going to work for our offices. And it's kind of like, don't shoot the messenger. I'm not, yeah. I'm not making the guidelines. I'm not doing that. I'm just helping you figure out how to make it happen while I see 80 patients a day or, or or 40 patients a day, whatever it is, just that go between. And, um, yeah, I've, I've taken some bullets for it too. So yeah, no, I, I've been there and I've seen it. And, um, even at times I've been, I, Andrea, if this is a confession, confessional, do you mind if I just, <laughs> there was one time where my assistant came to me and said, I went to this lecture and I saw Andrea Cook and she said this. And I turned to her and it may have been a tough morning. It was a while ago. And I said, I don't care what she said. This is how we're doing it here. And it's obviously a knee jerk reaction because maybe you've had a tough morning. Maybe you had that mom who was a little bit overbearing or that dad who was overbearing and, you know, it, it it's a tough, tough morning. And they say, oh, by the way, all those instruments that we're running through, um, they need to be bagged. They can't sit in that drawer unbagged because that's an OSHA violation. I heard Andrea Cook say that. And I think it's important for people to realize that it's not use. You're just reporting. You know, you're like a New York Times or a New York Post or whomever reporter. You didn't start the fire that burned down the tenement building. You didn't create that policy in Washington that you're reporting now they're, they're going to follow through and raise our taxes on. You're, you didn't create it. You're just reporting on it. You're telling us, and you're yeah. trying to protect us. And I'm trying to f- help offices <sighs> use a little bit of common sense with trying to follow these guidelines that are so strict and stringent. And uh, I don't really want this part of it recorded or, or played, but trying to find areas where we can almost compromise a little bit and say, hey, common sense says, I know what we need to do. But we're trying to make it work in our world as well. And so I don't want it being said that I compromise on everything and we can just, you know, slide through. But there has to be some kind of a, a balance between the, the stringent guidelines and true application. So, yeah. Do I need to take remove that, that part? Do I, need to, <laughs> do I need to actually remove that? No. Thank no. You. Just no. take it. Take it with a little grain of salt. So when I do say something, it's and it, it, it's true. This is not. Uh, I'm the messenger. I'm not the the regulator. I'm not the inspector. I'm not any regulatory body at all. And offices that have worked with me, they say, you know, they'll I'll come in and and things are definitely not in compliance. And they say, you don't you don't call the uh, OSHA or the state dental board, do you? And I said, no, that's not my place, or I wouldn't no. have a job ever again. I just help you implement changes that'll make it better for you. Yeah. Is all. So here's the the tough question: When, if ever, was the last time? you realized that maybe you'd given advice that was incorrect. Has it ever happened? 
Yeah. So we misinterpreted yeah. the law and said, hey, guys, you know, I said this, but you know what? I think I interpreted that one wrong. And I'm the first one to to say I am not perfect. I read the guidelines. When there's changes, I try and interpret them. I'm working on Washington's right now as far as interpreting it. And, yeah, everybody, I'm human. I make errors. I hope that when I do make an error, I fess up completely and say, hey, I read that wrong. This is how we're going to do it. This is what they really meant. And, and help you. But I'm not above error or misinterpretation or any of that. I do my best to have it not happen, but um, it, we're, we're all human, and I'm trying yeah. to interpret as much as anybody else. Yeah, we, we do the best we can, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I know you do beyond just sterilization because it's not exciting, but it is part of our lives. Um, you do scheduling stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I think at, I think at the Orthopreneur Summit this September – uh, which I'm thrilled to have you at. Uh, uh -huh. It's not the first time I've reached out to you, so I'm glad we finally got you this time. Yeah, I'm um, thrilled to be there. Yeah, and I know while I could sit and talk about sterilization and administration and things like that forever, and I'm not kidding. I mean, this is the stuff that it's the nitty-gritty details of practice that really I don't do that well, and I think it's useful to sort of follow through on. I think you're going to be talking about scheduling and running a more efficient schedule at Summit, right? I am. And that's one of the biggest things. It, it was interesting because when I was in the university to, today, one of the residents was doing his uh, thesis on what patients, how patients perceive a practice. What are the, what are the buttons that really push them? And two of the, two of the biggest buttons for patients from what these reports and Yelp reviews revealed was assistants not talking to the patients while they're in the clinic, you know, uh, chattering among themselves and not engaging with the patients and not running on time. Our world is so tightly wound right now. Um, I've got, you know, everything lined up. And if one of those dominoes doesn't work, it screws up the rest of my day. That's our world. That's our mom that's in the, the office. So we have to make sure that we're seeing them on time, giving them the experience that they want, communicating with them, treating them well in the clinic, well, all areas of the practice, and then getting them out of there on time because we're only a small piece of their world, but we can screw up the rest of it pretty quickly by running behind or doing more work without an approval from mom that says, yeah, it's okay to stay an extra 20 minutes while we, you know, bond sevens or whatever we're going to do. So those are the two real big bullet points for our patients at this point, that experience they get in the office. And one of them is running on time. Yeah. It takes a schedule to do it, a well-built schedule. It takes doctors playing the, the game and all team members following the rules and the guidelines as far as scheduling and paying attention and getting them in on out on time. And that's a huge piece of our world right now. Yeah. And, you know, it's been said in sales, you know, there are so many things that need to go right for sales to go properly. Yeah. But to ruin sales, only one thing has to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And schedule is one of them. And, you know, we, all of us in the orthodontic field have sat around and asked ourselves while sitting in a medical office, if I ran my office like they'd run this physician's office, I'd be out of business, right? Because they just don't care. I mean, we are, again, we're held to an unusually and unreasonably high standard uh, in our practices. And part of it's because we've set it there. But um, you're right. You know, you just can't keep people waiting. I mean, if that's your, there are practices that are money driven by, you know, maybe the lowest price in town. Mm -hmm. As opposed to where, you know what, the patient comes in and they wait for two hours and they're okay because, you know, they're one of 60 people in the reception area. And I'm sorry, in that case, it's a waiting room. It's yes, not a yes area. absolutely. There's 60 people in the waiting room and they know, hey, I'm paying 20 cents on the dollar, but I'm okay with that because, you know, I'll wait here for days. And in most of our practices, it's not quite like that. We charge a premium. We want to get paid a premium and the patients deserve our absolute best, which includes not waiting. And and I think the people that are on this podcast and the clients that I get the privilege of working with are in that world. They're not bottom dollar. They're not. They're not. It's expected if I pay more, I want more. I want to be seen on time. I want an experience. I want those things. I'm willing to pay for it. Not a problem. Yeah. But I want those things. And what really irks me is when I pay for it, 
pay for an experience and I don't get it. So I'm going to pay more to come see you. And you run behind your patient, your assistants are chattering amongst themselves and they're not engaging me. Now I'm irritated because you didn't provide. So we have to be cautious with that. And that, you know, the, the orthodox. Nice nice mission statement you printed on the wall, by the way. Thanks for uh, following that one. Yeah. It's the same, right? Oh, I love your mission statement. It's on the wall, but you know, your assistants aren't paying attention to me. Yeah. But none of you are following it. It means absolutely nothing. It's words on a wall. So we have to get that. But the patient that is paying for a $2,000 treatment, a $3,000 treatment down the road, that's great. That fits their world. That's what they need. But that's not our clients. That's not our patients. And we need to respect them for that. If they pay more, they deserve more than that. And running on time is a huge piece of it. Yeah. And I was taught years ago, uh, probably around 1995, I saw somebody speak. I don't remember who it was. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was that when I run on time, when I run late, if I'm more than say, I don't know, there's no set number, but you have a feel for when when you're running too late. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, my whole career, I don't send out an assistant to apologize for me. I take my gloves off. I walk out to the reception area. I sit down across from that patient and I apologize personally. To this day, I still do that. I sit down right across from them and I say what I was taught to say because I mean it, which is, um, hey, Andrea, um, first, I just want to apologize. I know you've been waiting here seven minutes, five minutes, whatever the number is. It's not 20 minutes. It's usually five to seven. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, hey, I know you've been waiting here for seven minutes and I apologize. But the most important person in the world is the one I'm with at that moment. And I promise that's going to be you in just a couple of minutes. And um I've never once in 27 years ever had a patient fight with me on that, ever. They might look at their watch and go, yeah, we're really trying to get out of here for a school event. And I say it again, if you feel it's too much, I totally understand if you need to reschedule. And I apologize from the bottom of my heart. But every person deserves my personal attention. And as you can guess, I can't run away from them in the middle if they need my time. The same way I wouldn't run away from you. And they get it. They understand it. They're human beings. Things happen. But But when someone doesn't say, even an assistant doesn't say, hey, your time is valuable and I apologize, right? You know, that's what irks people. And I think we have to take ownership of that, you know, and just don't brush it underneath the rug, accept it and be a human and apologize. And apologize before what you did was absolutely perfect. Hit it off right from the beginning before, because if you wait until after, so they've been sitting there for 15 minutes. You get them back into the clinic and then you say, oh, I'm so sorry we were running late today. That falls on a little bit of deaf ears. But if you head it off from the beginning and then you give them that option to say, if this doesn't work, you can reschedule, and get, you know, give them those options. That's taking it on head on. And that means so much to patients rather than a, a you know, blanket. Hey, I'm sorry we we're running late today at the end of the appointment. Yeah. That, that doesn't well- carry weight. And I, you know, I, what I found, and again, it's, I, I, this is not my Bible of how to treat people, but it's something I've just come across a couple of tens of thousands of times <laughs> is everybody who's reasonable. And some people are unreasonable, right? But for those people out there who are reasonable, um, maybe they've had a bad day. Maybe they're, you know, we don't know what's going on in their personal life. Maybe they're down to their rope. Um, but if you treat people like people, like individual human beings, whether it's for collections, whether it's treatment planning, whether it's waiting in the reception area, you know, if you just treat them like human beings one-on-one, let them know they're not just another cog in a giant wheel. Um, they tend to respond very favorably. It's very hard for you to be heartfelt and honest with somebody about how you're feeling and have them come back and snap your head off. And in the, in the rare cases where it's happened, they almost always undoubtedly apologize to me the next time I see them, even yeah. though it doesn't bother me. And so, yeah, I, I think it's a great topic. And, I could, I could talk to you, Andrea, all day long about this stuff, but um, I have to throw my shameless plug in there and tell people that, you know, if they want to hear you speak and spend some time with you, they should come to the Orthopreneur Summit in Dallas, September 13th and 14th. It starts at the 12th at night uh, with a just a kick-ass, I'm going to use that word ass, a kick-ass, because <laughs> um, i got a better question for you in two minutes. Um, it's going to be the most amazing meeting most people have ever attended. If they haven't been to last year's, which is our kickoff, they have no idea what they're going to be missing if they don't come. But it will be the meeting everybody talks about because it's going to be crazy. Um, but it kicks off Thursday night, the 12th of September, here in Dallas, with an amazing cocktail event. 
and it runs through Saturday night, the 14th, where we have the coolest mother of all block parties. Um, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it will be the greatest. And we got Relapse, the orthodontic band playing. So I've got to give a shout out to Brian Anderson, Christopher Setta. I think Chris Teeters, uh, Brian Anderson, Kyle Fagala, and Cole Johnson. I may have said Brian twice, but his biceps are so big, he gets mentioned twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Uh, just go to www. Why is it www? Who says that anymore? That's like a dumb <laughs> thing. <laughs> go to http colon backslash com. that's op summit 2019 you don't have to put www into it yeah it's going to go to osha.com um so um let's finish up the way i finish up all my podcasts with my 10 questions uh they're the 10 questions that james lipton the amazing interviewer for Inside the Actors Studio uh, for 20, 30 years had done. And he borrowed them from Bernard Pivot, who also did it. Um, and I love these questions because they tell you a lot about people. And I want you to answer as honestly and as quickly as you can. So yeah. you don't have to think too much about them. And, uh, you Nervous know, now, but go ahead. No, don't feel that. Last time, last one, Jonathan Nicosesis, uh, he asked me five questions. He asked me a question about if I was stranded on a desert island, what five albums would i take with me oh and it was like uh, yeah I, what would be your number one while we were here i figured as an homage to jonathan Icazesis, what would be your number one album uh i'm a tom petty fan um yeah, yeah i don't know which well i don't know which one of his tom petty or the traveling wilburys would be my album of choice right now traveling wilburys are pretty solid ah uh, yeah solid. they were good now but, i just know, i just dated myself right there didn't i yeah no not at all hey i agree <laughs> with you so what does it say on me you're, you're you're like 27 now right all, almost this year yeah yeah this yeah. Year. yeah this nice. year you know the interesting thing is you think about tom petty and i digress for just a second but someone pointed it out to me uh, someone i really respect it didn't occur to me that he might very well be alive today if someone had intervened up with airway with him oh wow he died in his sleep at a relatively younger age, retronathic. Um, you know, nobody's saying it was sleep apnea necessarily, but I've had a patient pass in their sleep and sleep apnea. And he shows the whole long face, retruded chin. Yeah. You know, and, you know, when someone said that to me, who I trusted a great deal, I was like, wow, you know, I never thought about it that way. He was a young guy and, you know, there was no drugs or alcohol from what I understand involved in his passing. And uh, I had a 35 year old patient die in their sleep uh, from sleep apnea one time with, you know, you don't know it's coming. You don't. so but I wish somebody would have saved him. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying it would have, but it was a great point to consider that that's the world we live in. And the theme yeah. of the summit this coming year is breathe easier. And the whole goal is people hear that and they think it's all about sleep apnea. And while about 35, 40% of it is some great speakers on different modalities that we can introduce in our practice to understand sleep apnea and widening the palate and other cool stuff. What we just discussed for the last 45 minutes about OSHA state boards if I learn how to handle that right, I'm going to breathe easier. Um, yeah. and, that, and that's why it's breathe easier, your patience and your practice. So we have some pretty cool stuff lined up and it's going to be a good time. So well, I'm very excited to be included. Oh, we're going to party you and me, Andrea. It's going to be, <laughs> it, because, I will, I will bring disinfectant wipes. We will be good to go. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Cause remember <laughs> at this meeting, every single meal, every single drop of food, every single drop of alcohol is on us. So oh, wow. my goal is just to bring everybody together. Everybody who's an orthodontist remembers GORP. I yeah. want to be GORP for grownups. And I don't mean that as disparaging comment to residents, but, you know, we were all treated like gold when we were residents in residency. I wanted to create a meeting where not only was the education amazing, but everybody feels like they were treated like a rock star from the moment they got there to the moment they were gone. And anybody out there who was there last year knows I'm not making that up. It is unlike any other meeting. So with that said, Let's move forward to the 10 questions. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. All right. Some of them are easy. Some of them are tough. I can't wait for number five because that's where it gets fun. Uh, so, see, now you're not even thinking about one through four. Now you think about number five. I know. Maybe I'll just mix them up and you'll never know. <laughs> you won't, I won't know. I, I can't know at this point, but I trust well, you. I trust if you. you. If you'd listened to the other podcasts, Andrea, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite ones was your cab driver, your Invisalign cab driver. 
Oh, Emily. Yeah. yeah. I think she's number two. And, you know, we keep digressing, but, you know, I was just, I was going to go visit an office because I like visiting an office. Hopefully once a month, I try to go visit a really good office or somebody I've heard is doing great work. And I just watch and see best practices. And every time I do that, my practice just runs so much better. Yeah. And I, and I was going to visit, um, Hurley and Volk, who I love to death out in the outskirts of Chicago. I hope they don't mind me giving them a shout out because Tanya and, and Ryan are amazing human beings. And, um, I think it was like a 40 minute ride and I got in the car and the, my Uber driver was telling me she had aligners in and, uh, and she asked me, as she said, what do you do? I said, I'm orthodontist. She goes, Oh, check out my Invisalign. And I said, Oh, that's cool. Who's doing it. And we figured out that she had a general dentist doing it, not an orthodontist. And the more I talked to her, the more it just started making more sense that I had to ask her about her experience. And if you listen to it, like you said, the, the second one, it was so interesting to hear her take and how she went to a general dentist because all of her friends went to general dentist because all the, Orthodontists they went to said they don't do Invisalign or they wouldn't treat her with Invisalign. And the GPs who didn't know better did. And that's why they ended up, it was like the weirdest thing. It was really great yeah. insight. So um, now it's your turn to get your 10 questions. So there. Okay. Uh, it's almost Passover. So in a Jewish household, we have the 10, the 10 plagues that we recount. We're going to give you the 10 questions now. So yeah. here you go. Okay. What, what is your favorite word? Absolutely. Ooh. What is your least favorite word? Uh, um, always and never. Ooh. That's always. which is two, which is two, and I apologize. Um, okay. So what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? <sighs> One of my favorite things, and it sounds uh, anyway, um, when I connect with one of my offices and they get it, that just does it for me. It's so fun and so enlightening when they say, I get it. So if I can teach somebody something and it, it makes sense and they understand it, that just really drives me business-wise. Personally, I have four grandkids and they just melt my world. Oh, that's nice. How many kids do you have? I have two. Nice. I have two kids, four grandkids, and that's all I'm going to get. They're both done. <laughs> so two kids, four grandkids, eight great grandkids, 16, you know, just keep going by twos, right? Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. So what turns you off? People who are not happy in their life, whether it's by their choice or whatever it is, you can tell that people are happy in their life the way they live. Um, just being an unhappy person, that just gets me because you have choices. You have choices to be unhappy. If you don't like something, make a change, make a decision, do something about it. But don't just sit in your place and be unhappy. So what really get, turns you off is apathy. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, the dreaded number five, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> here comes number five. Now, we'll go to number six. I just want to skip five. Now, I'm kidding. Okay. So, <laughs> ready, Andrea? Number I five. Am. What is... Your favorite curse word? Oh, probably as big as I go is. Oh, we want favorite. Oh, uh, probably I'd have to say shit. So, yeah, um, I have. I, curse words don't bother me. Language doesn't bother me at all. Um, it doesn't come out of my mouth very easily yeah. or very often. So my kids had an intervention one time where they were going to help me and try and teach me how to speak that language and i failed miserably i said i just can't do that oh come on mom you can do it no i i just can't so my so kids cool. are good for something oh well, they tried you know they tried i failed yeah, yeah i'm okay with it my name is andrea and i can't curse right? <laughs> yeah. my favorite one ever when, when james lipton used to do this he would question the world's most famous actors, actresses, directors, you know, just remarkable Richard Attenborough, like Meryl Streep, you know, uh, people from Matthew McConaughey to Al Pacino. I mean, like everybody came on his show. And I always remember my favorite curse word that was ever said on the show, which ultimately became arguably my favorite one, which you never, ever hear anybody say was Alec Baldwin said ass bag. Which I've never, <laughs> 
<laughs> I never heard the word ass bag, but he used it in a sentence. It was great. Oh, it makes total sense in a sentence. Yeah. So let's go to number six. Okay. What, sa- what sound or noise do you love? Oh. Um, okay. I live in Seattle, but something is very you, calming to me. You don't live in Seattle for the record. Oh, I don't. Yes. I do not live in Seattle. I live in the Lake Taps area, south of Seattle. Yes, but to everybody out there, it's about 45 minutes from Seattle, but she tries to make it easier on you. <laughs> yeah, because nobody knows where Lake Taps is. Think about w- the White River Amphitheater. <laughs> yeah, I live right by that. <laughs> One of my favorite sounds is the sound, and it happened today when we get a big dump of rain, and it's dark, and you can smell it, and you can hear mm-hmm. that sound of rain, and now I've got the frogs going because of the rain. That's very calming to me. It sounds like that. wonderful. Yeah, it's the same out here in Texas. When the snakes eat the frogs, it's such a nice sound. <laughs> <laughs> the frogs out here don't croak because if they do, they're going to croak. They're going to get eaten. <laughs> they're gonna croak. Um, what sound or noise do you hate? Um, people chewing loudly sets me off. People what? Chewing loudly. Oh, yeah. With their mouth open, kind of. That just happened to me yesterday. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. That sets me off for some reason. I was sitting at a at a banquet and I was at those round tables and I was at the like six thirty seven o'clock position of my table and there was a guy at like the one thirty position of his table right behind me and all I could hear while someone was talking was just like oh 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 he couldn't have been more than six inches from my ear. <laughs> oh my gosh! And not only that, but he wouldn't stop eating. <laughs> So I am really sensitive to that right now, and I agree with you 100%. And I know where uh, he lives. <laughs> I, know would ha- he lives. I would have to move. I, I'm that. I, I yeah. was about to. I was about to move, and I know my wife would have kicked me in the shin. So instead, <laughs> I just stayed, and I shot out his porch light this morning. So it's all <laughs> hey, good. All feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Um, what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Architecture. Oh, that's cool. What debated profession? on the debated on that when I went into clinical consulting and that side of it was going into office design and the architecture side versus uh, the route I took, which is the clinical side of the practice. Very cool. Oh, by the way, that leaves me just a quick side note. Question 8A, which has nothing <laughs> to do with this. If I was going to build an office tomorrow, would you be somebody I want to consult or do most of the dental architecture firms understand what I need to do to make things right? And I'm going to plug my own business here. They do not get, they do not know how to design a sterilization area that they don't advise you on what equipment they will ask you. So what do you want for your equipment? What do you want in there? Well, um, I'm the one that comes in and says, no, this is what we need. This is the space we need. This is a, the equipment we need. Uh, this is the drawer design. We need those pieces. So tooting my own horn. Yeah. You really do. And don't listen to a lot of the dental reps that are out there. They don't know ortho. Um, so I, I caution everybody there. Anyway. Awesome. Yeah, just when you said it, it made me think that maybe, you know, if you're up to date on all the laws and they're not, how would I know I need two sinks? Yeah. Right? That's- Great. I, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, two questions left. What profession would you not like to do? Probably the, um, the septic pumpers. <laughs> micro dirty jobs yeah i don't i don't no i don't do well with that no or the honey bunk dumpers no i couldn't do that anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know if any of us would really do well with that if you well, said i do if you said hey my cousin he does really well with that i mean i start to get really worried <laughs> if, he, if he does really well with the porta potties you know he's just yeah. to do that yeah um, i know somebody has to do it it's just it's just not my wheelhouse Hey, I'm right with you. Um, and last but not least, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You have lived a good life. Amen. I like that. I have no doubt you have. And I know you've helped a lot of people. So I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today and spending time with me and, you know, a thousand of our closest friends out here. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to spending some time with you in September at the summit. Uh, I'm also looking forward to some time having you in my office um, so that you can then let me not sleep at night uh, (laughs) before I implement all the amazing things you tell me to implement so I may begin to sleep at night. Um, 
<laughs> but no, really, I, I really value what it is you do. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the time where we get you in uh, to the office. Oh. And it's, it's time like this that really makes me realize I need to, I need to get you there to do this. And so. Well, until um, I have the opportunity to work with each one of the you and each one of the attendees, please use me as a resource. Ask me questions. I'm, I'll help you as much as I can. I know I can't be everywhere. I know everybody can't automatically just have me come in, but I'm here to help and answer questions. And I am so thrilled to be invited to the meeting and speaking at the meeting. And I hope all of you chew quietly at the meeting. That's all I got to say. That's awesome. It's awesome. So for anybody out there who ever has any questions uh, for Andrea, please feel free to email me at doc, D-O-C, at kriegersmiles.com. I'm always there to assist you in any way I can. Uh, Really appreciate everybody tuning in, so to speak, and listening to this tonight. And uh, again, on behalf of everybody, Andrea, I just want to say thank you. And uh, until we all meet, meet again, I'm always here for you. And I just wish you an amazing day, amazing week, and just an awesome time in practice.